Thank you very much for, uh, to Aberystwyth and Queen's University Green Fund for the Zoom license we're using. And um, let me introduce um, Gabby. So um, Gabrielle Proven is a research scientist at the University of Leicester who has worked extensively on understanding the unique magnetospheric dynamics of the outer planets and has contributed multiple pieces of seminal work that have significantly shaped our understanding of these plasma environments. As well as this noteworthy research standing, Gabby is also highly engaged in a number of outreach and public engagement activities, having led multiple STFC funded projects and reaching an impressively wide audience range. And um, Gabby is also responsible for the Planetarella at Leicester, which is a um, truly trailblazing piece of public engagement um, uh, equipment. Um, today, she is speaking on magnetospheric ionospheric coupling at Saturn and Jupiter in the era of, Jun in the era of Juno and Cassini. So take it away, Gabby. So thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for asking me to give this seminar. Okay, I am going to start Hi, my seminar. I'm Gabby, and I'm going oh. to talk about magnetosphere. And as you might have guessed, I've recorded the sound already to save my voice, and I'll be able then to talk to you in the chat. So off we go. Hi, I'm Gabby, and I'm going to talk about magnetosphere ionosphere coupling at Saturn and Jupiter in the era of Cassini and Juno. The work that I will be presenting will focus heavily on research performed by the Leicester team, including Stan Cowley, Emma Bunz, Johnny Nichols, Greg Hunt, Tom Bradley, myself and others. The gas giants Jupiter and Saturn have many similarities. They're both rapid rotators with powerful magnetic fields. They both have moons with active volcanoes providing internal sources of plasma inside the magnetospheric cavity. And obviously both planets, like the Earth, are buffeted by the sun's solar wind. Ultimately, it is a driving of the planetary magnetosphere by internal drivers and by the external solar wind that sets up a series of field line currents which couple the planetary magnetosphere to the ionosphere and which ultimately are responsible for the amazing auroral displays that tell us so much about the planetary environment. And it is this magnetosphere ionosphere coupling which we're going to be talking about today, starting with Jupiter. Until the arrival of Juno at Jupiter in 2016, one of the main sources of information about magnetosphere ionosphere coupling at Jupiter was from the aurora in particular UV auroral observations from the Hubble Space Telescope and infrared from the ground. So this is an iconical image of the Jovian UV aurora from Hubble, where with increasing latitude in the ionosphere, we observe auroral emissions associated with magnetosphere moon interactions at Io, Europa and Ganymede, a relatively steady main auroral oval which dominates the overall auroral power output and maps magnetically to the middle magnetosphere, and a spatially structured variable swirl aurora mapping variously to the cusp magnetopause on the day side and into the far tail on the night side. And based on data from Voyager and Galileo and previous modelling work, in the 2000s, Stan Cowley and his co-authors modelled ionospheric plasma flow and ultimately the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling currents, which can be compared with these overall observations, and with in situ data when Juno finally arrived at Jupiter in 2016. Cowley et al. in 2005 and 2007 derived models of plasma flow, coupling currents, and resulting auroral emissions at ionospheric heights to be compared with the observed auroral emissions. Cowley et al. in 2008 combined these ionospheric models with a magnetospheric magnetic field model to create a model of magnetosphere ionos ionospheric coupling at Jupiter. This allowed a direct connection between Juno's observations in the magnetosphere and their rural response in the ionosphere. The 2008 paper made predictions for what Juno would observe when it finally arrived at Jupiter in 2016 based on Juno's planned orbits. This work was updated in 2016, when it became clear that Juno's orbits around Jupiter had been modified at orbit insertion. 
I will, I now, I will now give a brief description of these models. Cowley and Bounce, 2001, produced this sketch of Jupiter's inner and middle magnetosphere. The sketch shows plasma in Jupiter's magnetosphere originating from Aya orbiting at 6 Javian radii, producing primarily sulfur and oxygen ions as well as electron, electrons. The plasma is confined to a near toroidal plasma sheath by the centrifugal action of the near keratating plasma flow. This plasma diffuses outwards into the middle magnetosphere and is eventually lost down the tail. As the plasma diffuses outwards, its angular velocity begins to fall. This results in a differential velocity in the ionosphere between the neutral particles which rotate with the planet and the charged particles which rotate with the flux tubes. This results in an ionospheric torque which is communicated to the magnetic via the magnetic field lines. These magnetic field lines are being bent out of the meridional plane into a lagging configuration observed as a deflection in the B5 component with a negative deflection in the northern hemisphere and a positive deflection in the southern. The ionospheric torque acts to spin the flux tubes back up towards corrotation whilst despinning the atmosphere. The current system associated with this co-rotation co breakdown is shown as dashed lines. So ionospheric Peterson currents flow equatorwards in both hemispheres and close as outward radial currents in the plasma sheet shown here. A system of field line currents are set up. The inner field line currents are directed outwards from the ionosphere to the magnetosphere where the angular velocity begins to depart from co-rotation. So these are the upward field line currents associated with electrons propagating into the ionosphere, creating Jupiter's main auroral oval. At higher latitudes, the field line currents are directed inwards from the magnetosphere towards the ionosphere, resulting in downward field line currents into the polar cap area. In addition to the Jovian current system just discussed, Currents are also expected to flow at the boundary between the tail and the outer magnetosphere. Due to the shear between the moderately sub plasma flow in outer magnetosphere region and the strongly sub plasma flow on field lines mapping to the tail. So the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling model starts by defining a simple realistic model of Jupiter's internal magnetic field that is tilted with respect to Jupiter's spin axis. The system is assumed to be steady state and axis symmetric. So we originally used dipole coefficients of the VIP4 empirical model by Kennedy et al. in 1988 to define the planetary dipole field tilted with respect to the planet's spin axis by 9.515 degrees. The field components and the flux functions are given by these by these equations here, where of course the internal azimuthal field about the magnetic axis is zero. In the magnetosphere, we have also considered the magnetic field of the JV magnetodisc by including the Kanunit or 1981 model of the equatorial current sheet. We can then map between the ionosphere and the magnetosphere by the constancy of the flux function along each field line, with the small effect of the current sheet field has been neglected in the ionosphere. So this is the magnetic flux function in the ionosphere, and this is the magnetic flux, flux function in the magnetosphere, including the flux from the Kanerni current disk. At the bottom of the page, we show a figure from Edwards et al, 2001, showing the field lines from a dipole magnetic field plus the current sheet, given by the contours of constant flux. You can see how the current sheet radially extends the equatorial field lines. Based on Voyager and Galileo data, and also previous modelling work, Cowley et al. in 2005 and 2008 model the plasma flow in four regions of the Jovian magnetosphere. The plasma flow is assumed to be steady state and axisymmetric about the magnetic axis.
The equations for the plasma angular velocity normalized to Jupiter's angular velocity is given at the bottom of the page and is also plotted on the figure on your left. Where the hor horizontal dashed line indicates plasma, which is visually co rotating with the planet. So you can see we've defined four regions of flow within the magnetosphere. We have the inner region, shown in white, where the plasma visually co rotates. This region occurs inside of about 15 Jovian radii in the equatorial magnetosphere. Extending to ionospheric latitude of 17.3 degrees. We then have the middle magnetosphere, shown here in red, where the plasma angular velocity falls continuously with increasing radial distance. This region maps to the equatorial magneto disk between 15 and 50 RJ. At the outer edge of the middle magnetosphere, at about 50 RJ, which maps to an ionospheric, ionospheric latitude of 15.3 degrees, plasma flow is about a third of that of rigid co-rotation. I'd like to point out that this fall in angular velocity across the middle magnetosphere takes place over about two degrees of ionospheric latitude, between 15.3 and 17.3 degrees. Next, we have the outer magnetosphere region, shown in yellow, stretching between ionospheric latitudes of 10.7 and 15.3 degrees, mapping to the cushion region on the day side. And finally, we have the tail region, and within which the plasma strongly sub rotates This region stretches from the pole to an, to an ionospheric latitude of 10.7 degrees. We assume that the drag due to ion neutral collisions causes the neutral atmosphere to similarly rotate at angular frequency k times the plasma angular frequency delta omega i. And I should explain that when delta omega i is equal to zero, this corresponds to rigid plasma co rotation in the inertial frame. We can then determine the plasma velocity within the ionospheric Peterson layer relative to the neutral gas, the electric field in the neutral atmosphere rest frame, and finally, the ionospheric Peterson current density, with sigma p is the ionospheric Peterson conductivity. With a couple of assumptions, we can integrate the ionospheric Peterson current density in height through the Peterson layer to determine the meridional horizontal Peterson current intensity flowing in the ionosphere at co-latitude theta i. And this current is defined to be positive equatorwards in both hemispheres. We can then integrate the horizontal Peterson current intensity in azimuth around the magnetic axis to find the total meridian horizontal Peterson current flowing equatorwards in the ionosphere, given here as a function of ionospheric co-latitude. Meridian or Peterson current increases across the tail region and peaks at 35 megagrams at the boundary between the tail and the outer magnetosphere. It then falls by about 6 megagrams at this boundary as the angular velocity, shown again on your left, rises. It then rises further across the outer magnetosphere to peak at 55 megagrams near the boundary with the middle magnetosphere region and then falls rapidly across the middle magnetosphere region as the flow rises to rigid co-rotation. Current continuity then determines the field line current density just above the ionosphere required by the divergence of the Peterson currents. And we've plotted this as a function of ionospheric co-latitude here on the right. You can see that the field line currents are directed downwards, negative, in the regions where the Peterson current increases with co-latitude and directed upwards positive in the regions where the Peterson currents decrease with the ionospheric latitude. So you can see that the model predicts two clear layers of upward directed field line current, meaning the precipitation of electrons downwards into the, the ionosphere. One of these layers is at the boundary between the tail and the outer magnetosphere, 
The largest cone is predicted to be associated with the middle magnetosphere region, and this is then attributed to Jupiter's main auroral oval. Considering the two current loops I described earlier, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern, comprising of the ionospheric Peterson currents, the field line currents, and the magnetosphere closure currents. Well, by Ampere's law, these current loops are consistent with an azimuthal magnetic field coming out of the page in the northern hemisphere and going into the page in the southern hemisphere. So this is the bent back or the swept back field, negative in the northern hemisphere and positive in the southern. And so we can calculate this bent back field B5 just above the ionospheric layer using the ionospheric Peterson current that we have already calculated and applying Ampere's law to a circular path of radius rho, where rho is the perpendicular distance from the magnetic axis. This northern hemisphere, ionospheric as a mutual magnetic field, defined as a function of ionospheric collatitude, is plotted here in the right-hand corner. So you can see that the BFI component is negative, and you can observe two large reflections in the azimuthal field at the boundary between the tail and the open magnetosphere, and at the boundary between the outer, mag outer magnetosphere and the middle magnetosphere. So we have a modern azimuthal magnetic field associated with plasma subcarotation just above the ionosphere, but how do we compare this with Juno data? Juno is, after all, not flying through the Jovian ionosphere. Well, Ampere's law tells us that B5 times rho should be constant along a field line. So we can calculate the azimuthal field at a perpendicular distance rho from the magnetic axis using the following equation. And considering the dipole magnetic field and the flux functions we discussed earlier, we can then produce this contour plot of field and current in the magnetic meridian rho z plane, where the black dotted rectangle shows the canary current disk. Specifically, we show magnetic field lines in black mapping to the, to the ionosphere between 5 and 25 degrees ionospheric collatitude. While the inner field lines are quasi-dipolar in form as expected, the high latitude field lines are strongly radially extended due to the azimuthal current flowing in the equatorial sheet. The green lines delineate magnetic field lines where major upward directed field line currents flow in this steady state model. Specifically, the outer pair of solid green line correspond to the current between the outer magnetosphere and the tail. The inner pair to the centre of the ionospheric footprint of the middle magnetosphere region. The red and blue solid lines then show positive and negative contours, respectively, of the azimuthal field B5 produced by the magnetosphere ion ionosphere coupling currents. The next question to ask is whether we need to accelerate the electrons down the field lines to produce the peak upward field line current densities required by the model. To calculate this, we turn to NICE theory from 1973. Now, I haven't really got time to go into this, but based on Voyager and Galileo data, Stan estimated that within the middle of the region, the peak current density that can be carried by hot isotropic electrons with our field line accelerations is 15 nanoamps per square meters. Since the peak middle magnetosphere upward current required by the model exceeds this by a factor of 30, downward accelerations is required to create the bright aurora seen in Jupiter. So here we present the overall acceleration parameters needed to produce the upward field line current densities required by the model. The top plot shows the minimum field line acceleration voltage, and the bottom plot shows the minimum radial distance along the field line of the field align acceleration region. On the left, we show the PJ1 trajectory mapped into a magnetic meridian 
in cylindrical rose head coordinates. The trajectory is drawn in red and we are showing Juno's trajectory from about two and a half days before perigeo to two and a half days after. I should say that the wiggling trajectory is due to the offset of Jupiter's magnetic axis to the spin axis, something which we thankfully never had to think about for Cassini at Saturn, but more of that later on. The black lines show contours of model field lines mapping to the ionosphere at intervals of five degrees latitude between the poles and 25 degrees ionospheric latitude. This field then being the sum of the dipole component of JRM09 and the new ring current model. In order to demark the different magnetospheric re regions, we are using the same color code as before. The blue area then shows field lines mapping to the tail. The yellow shows field lines mapping to the outer magnetospheric region. Red to the middle magnetosphere and white to the inner magnetosphere. Juno's approach is approaching Jupiter from the Northern Hemisphere region, through perigeo and then out into the Southern Hemisphere region. As it does so, Juno is located within the Outer Magnetospheric region for the majority of the time, predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere, but, but repeatedly it traverses into the Middle Magnetospheric region, predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere, but also in the Southern. Close to perigeo, it also passes through field lines which map to the tail and the inner magnetosphere. On the right, we are showing the model parameters versus time, showing a two-day interval centered on periapsis. So the top panel shows the mapped ionospheric collatitude, where blue shows the spacecraft map to the northern hemisphere and red to the southern. The horizontal dotted lines indicate the magnetospheric regimes to which the field lines map, with the vertical colour bar showing when Juno is located within the different regions. The second panel shows the normalised plasma angular velocity. The third panel shows the poloidal field components Br and B theta. The fourth panel shows the field line current density at the spacecraft. Where red is positive current moving upwards from the ionosphere and blue is negative current moving downward into the ionosphere in both hemispheres. The fifth panel shows the swept back field B phi. And then in the bottom panel, we focus on the interval around periapsis, showing eight hours of data during which Juno traversed both the northern and the southern tail field regions between dawn and dusk. So the top panel shows the field line current density in the same form as before. So you can see that the spacecraft is most often immersed in regions of downward current, interspersed with short intervals of strong upward currents, shown here in red. The swept back field B5 is now plotted on an enhanced y-axis and so you can see clear negative deflections in the northern hemisphere and positive in the southern. And the minimum radius of the ele electron acceleration region is shown in the upward current region is shown in the bottom panel together with the spacecraft radial distance. So you can see that close to perigeo, the spacecraft is located below the electron acceleration region here. So should observe accelerated electrons responsible for the main auroral emission. Looking again at PJ1, I wanted to compare the observed magnetic field data with predictions from our model. I focus on magnetic field observations made when Juno is located at rho is less than 30 RJ, corresponding to the distance within which the Canoni current is model most accurately describes the JV magneto disk. So I'm showing here data for approximately a three day interval centered close to perigeo on PJ1. The top plot shows Juno's mapped ionospheric latitude as discussed earlier. In the second panel in black, 
we show the residual B5 component of the Jovian magnetic field as detected by Juno. So this is the magnetic field observed by Juno minus the JRM09 internal field model. The red line is then the model B5 component from our model. In the third and fourth panels, we show the residual poloidal components BR and B theta in black, with the modeled Canoni current sheet, sheet field shown in red. Focusing on the B5 component, we can see that the magnitude of the observed field agrees pretty well with the modeled field. And on field lines mapping to the red middle magnetosphere region, the observed and the model field appears to agree well. However, when Juno is on field lines mapping to the yellow outer magnetosphere region, we appear to have an antiphase relationship between the observed and the model field. And by this I mean when the observed B5 decreases with time, such as here, the model B5 increases with time. And also, when the observed B5 increases with time, the model B5 decreases with time. So this was a bit of a surprise. So then moving on to studying data from PJ3, as Juno did not record data on PJ2. We're sharing data in the same form as before. So presenting data for when Juno is located within 30 RJ, just over three days of data centered there, of course, on PJ3. And so you can see that the orbit is changing, moving closer to the equatorial plane as the Juno moves inbound in the northern hemisphere and further from the equatorial plane as Juno moves outbound in the southern hemisphere. On the left, we are again showing the mapped ionospherical latitude and the B, phi, B, R, and B theta components of the magnetic fields, these being the residual uh, field components when JRM09 has been subtracted. And again, you can see this antiphase relationship between the observed and the model B5 components within the outer magnetosphere region, but not within the middle magnetosphere region. It's especially clear here in the southern hemisphere because the spacecraft spent several days traversing the outer magnetosphere region on its outbound trajectory, but it is also present in the northern hemisphere. Moving on then to PJ6, which we will be studying in more detail in a moment. So I'm showing data in the same format as PJ1 and PJ3. And again, uh, for the B5 component, you can see this antiphase relationship between the modelled and the observed by B5 within the outer magnetosphere region, Spe certainly at larger radial distances. But you don't see these relationships within the middle magnetosphere region or within field lines mapping to the tail. So what's going on? In effect, we are plotting the gradient of the observed B5 with ionospheric collapsed at essentially a fixed R as the plant rotates. And so we need to consider how the B5 varies with ionospheric collapsed. In our model, B5 increases in magnitude with increasing collapsed for a fixed R because the ionospheric Peterson current increases with collapsed in the model ionosphere as we've discussed earlier. However, the data seems to be suggesting that B5 is actually decreasing in magnitude with increasing collapsed. So giving you this opposite sense between the model and the data. So if you had a constant ionospheric Peterson current, the largest value of B5 would be calculated at the smallest co-latitude for a fixed star. This is basically a geographical effect. So since our model, uh, I'm sorry, since our data seems to be suggesting that B5 is decreasing in magnitude with increasing collatitude, this suggests that the geographical effect is dominating. This could occur if the downward field line currents associated with the swept back B5 are concentrated nearer the pole 
with the ionospheric penis and currents then being nearly constant with collateral across most of the outer magnetosphere region until Juno enters the middle magnetosphere region. Moving then on to Jupiter's field line currents. Initial observations reported by the Juno team seem to suggest that field line currents associated with Jupiter's main oral oval could not be detected by Juno's magnetometers. And this came as a bit of a surprise to us considering our early discuss discussions. But then in 2019, Kotsiaras et al. presented an extensive study of magnetic field perturbations measured during Juno's transit of Jupiter's polar region and demonstrated field line currents associated with Jupiter's auroral emissions. Phew! So they presented Jupiter's UV auroral emissions uh, for the first 11 PJs. Uh, the UV images are shown as colour ratios with a colour bar that renders the depth of emissions, with red representing emissions from deeper in the atmosphere, while white indicates UV emissions with less atmospheric absorption. Overlaid are the colour coded residual B5 for each perigeo, with blue representing negative B5 and red positive B5. So you can see there are strong deflections in B5 associated with the main auroral emissions, negative in the northern hemisphere and positive in the southern, indicating the presence of strong field line currents as expected. Cotiaras et al. in 2019 focus on data from Southern Hemisphere PJ6 in this paper, as this was the PJ showing the most intense B5 deflections. We have done the same, showing the same 24 minutes of data as Cotiaras et al. observed just after Perijove for PJ3, when Juno traverses three field lines mapping to the inner magnetospheric region, the middle magnetosphere, the outer magnetosphere, and the tail. So in this panel, in the top plot, shows you the mapped atmospheric latitude mapped to the southern hemisphere. In the second panel, then shows you the observed and modelled B5 data, where the observed data is shown in black, so this is the residual B5 component, and the modelled in red. And the final panel shows you the modelled field line current density just above the ionosphere, where red is positive, showing you an upwards current, and blue is negative. You can see that the increase, so there, you can see that there is an increase in the B5 component across the middle and into the outer magnetosphere of about 400 nanoteslas, from about minus 150 nanoteslas to about 200 nanoteslas or so. Now the model predicts B5 value increase to about 200 nanoteslas across the middle magnetosphere region. So this is a really good agreement between the model and the data here. And this is true even though Cotillard et al. said that the observed B5 was surprisingly small. We know that the model predicts a large upper current across the middle magnetosphere region associated with this increase in B5. Now, at the boundary between the outer magnetosphere and the tail, the model predicts a small increase in B5 and an upward current, while we observe a decrease in B5, suggesting a downward current. Now, how can this be explained? Well, the model reasonably assumes that the plasma angular velocity is very low on open field lines and increases as you cross into the outer magnetosphere region. For a constant conductivity, this would result in a decrease in the ionospheric Peterson current uh, as you cross from the tail into the outer magnetosphere to an upward current. And in our model, model we have assumed a constant ionospheric Peterson conductivity of 0.25 mo. But if the conductivity is not constant, but instead increases and cross the boundary, then that would reduce the drop in the Peterson current and might even lead to a downward current at the open closed field and boundary between the outer magnetosphere and the tail. So these observations, su suggesting a possible downward current, 
between the outer manusphere and the tail may be in good agreement with recent overall observations. The up, upward field line current in the model at the boundary between the outer melissa and, and the tail would be would be expected to produce a second auroral oval, palmwood of the main auroral oval, which does not seem to be there, at least not regularly. So having a downward current at the boundary between the outer melissa and the tail due to an increase in conductivity on closed field lines might be a good modification for our model. So we know that Jupiter's auroras are very dynamic and brighter auroras obviously mean stronger field line coupling currents. So can we see evidence of this? In 2019, Johnny Nichols et al. observed a few days enhancement of Jupiter's azimuthal and radial magnetic field together with the significant brightening of Jupiter's dawn side auroral emissions. This represents the first evidence of control of Jupiter's main auroral emission intensity by magnetosphere ionosphere coupling currents. So we have talked a lot about Jupiter, but what about Saturn? And Saturn, the Cassini spacecraft, orbited the planet for 13 years, and even on its approach phase, it was making fascinating discovery. Cowley et al. in 2005 studied Saturn's auroral emission as observed by the Hubble Space Telescope when Cassini was approaching Saturn and observing the solar wind. They reported that following the, the arrival of the co-rotating interaction region, bright auroras were first observed to expand significantly polewards in the dawn sector, such that the area of the polar cap was much reduced, following which auroral spiral structures were formed. They concluded that the auroral brightening was due to compression-induced reconnection at Saturn, as also observed on Earth. The auroral spiral structures were due to reconnection and rotation of newly opened and newly closed field lines. Cowley et al. in 2004 proposed a model to describe the large-scale flows and currents in Saturn's magnetosphere. This diagram then shows the flows in the magnetospheric equatorial plane expanding to the magnetopause at 20 Saturn radius in the subsolar region. In the inner region, the plasma rotates in the same sense as the planet, with an angular velocity which falls from near rigid co-rotation in the innermost region to 50-60% of co-rotation in the outer part of the middle magnetosphere. The subcurrotation of plasma is believed to be due to particle pickup from internal sources combined with radial transport. Surrounding this is a layer where the planetary plasma is lost down the dusk flank by plasma deformation and field line pinch up, as discussed by Russell Lunis for Jupiter. At the days of magnetopause, we have open flux production, following which the open field lines are stretched downstream by solar wind flow to form the tail lobes, from which flux eventually returns by reconnection closure and sunward flow. On the dawn side of the magnetosphere, we then have sunward directed return flow of closed flux tubes from the tail. Steph Jinks and colleagues produced this sketch of a magnetic meridian cross section through Saturn's magnetosphere illustrating schematically the current systems and lagging perturbations associated with the subcurrotation of plasma. The current system are indicated by arrow dashed lines, and you can see a system of four current sheets. You can see downward currents into the polar cap and upward currents between the closed field line region and the polar cap region. And then you can see a second system of downward and upward currents uh, mapping to larger ionospheric collapsed fields. The schematic showing the four main sheets of field line currents in Saturn's magnetosphere is in part, in part based on the work of Greg Hunt, who has been studying field line currents in Saturn's magnetosphere from deflections in the B5 component of the magnetic field throughout the Cassini mission. In 2014, Hunt et al investigated the field line magnetosphere ionosphere coupling currents on 31 Cassini passes across 
sat in southern hemisphere post in my midnight auroral region. So on the right, we're showing you the, uh, you the trajectory of three of these revs in the XZ, XY, and YZ plane, and also mapped to the ionosphere. On the left, you can see data from the southern hemisphere plotted as a function of southern ionospheric latitude for two of these revs, Rev 92 and Rev 78. So for each rev, the top plot shows you the CAPS electron data. The second panel shows you the B5 component of the field mapped to the ionosphere. And the third panel shows you something called a sudden PPO phase. And for the uninitiated, I will get to this in a minute. So Greg reported a weak downward current over the polar cap with a field line current density of approximately 10 nanoamps per square meters. At the northern ionospheric latitude of 15.5 degrees, he reported an, an enhanced downward cu uh, current, and he defined this to be current sheet one. Current sheet two was observed between 17 and 19 degrees northern ionospheric latitude, and it was associated with a peak upward current of approximately 100 nanoms per square meter. Sheet three and sheet four are two subsidiary downward than upward currents of approximately 100 nanoms per square meter. But what you can see is that the upward current observed at Rev in Rev 78 here is much larger than the upward current observed at Rev 92. And you can see, if you look at the top of the plot, that these two revs occur at almost antiphase, antiphase in the sudden PPO cycle. For Rev 92, the sudden PPO phase is almost 90 degrees, and for Rev 78, it is almost 270. So what are the PPOs of which I speak? PPOs, or planetary period oscillations, are oscillations that are close to Saturn's planetary period observed throughout the Saturn's turning magnetospheric system in more or less any magnetospheric, magnetospheric or ionospheric data set you care to study, from planetary radio emissions to magnetic field data, auroral emissions, particle data, you name it, at Saturn the data set will oscillate, oscillate at the PPO period. Over the years, we have discovered that there are two PPO systems, one in each hemisphere. And on the far right, you will see a schematic of the northern and southern PPO magnetic field perturbation loops, drawn in blue, superposed on the planetary field in black. So you can see that there's basically one loop for the, no for the northern system in the northern hemisphere and one for the southern system in the southern hemisphere. The loops are consistent with the quasi-uniform perturbation loop in the equatorial plane, pointing away from the planet at zero degrees PPO phase and towards the planet at 180 degrees PPO phase for both systems. Ampere's law will tell you that such a magnetic perturbation loop requires a current, shown here in green, coming out of the page towards you in the top diagram and going into the page away from you in the bottom. So if you then study the PPO system in a 90 to 270 degrees plane, rather 90 to 270 degrees planes, rather than a 0 to 100, so you're now looking basically into the page, uh, you, you find that our observations are consistent with two loops of field line currents, where the currents go down the metal field lines into the ionosphere, out of the ionosphere, through the ionosphere and then up again out of the ionosphere. And they close partially in the opposite hemisphere and partially in the equatorial, in the equatorial plane. And you've got one loop of these field line currents for the northern system and another one for the southern system. You can see that for the northern system, we see the main upward field line currents at 90 degrees and the main downward field line currents at 270. Well, for the southern system, we have the main upward field line currents out of the ionosphere at 270 and the main downward at, at 90 degrees. On the far left, we're looking at Saturn from above the North Pole down 
down at the northern ionosphere and then through the planet to the southern ionosphere. And you can see the system of field line currents moving into and out of the ionosphere. And they are consistent with the PPOs being driven out of the ionospheric region by rotating twin cell convection patterns. Work done by the lesser group led by Greg Hunt and Tom Bradley have, have studied the field line current signatures in the B5 magnetic field component for all appropriate trajectories on the Cassini mission. So this is so this is for all orbits which cut through the field line current regions. And they have calculated the ionospheric B5 and determined the ionospheric meridional Peterson currents associated with the B5 deflections using Ampere's law. They have organized both the B5 and the ionospheric meridional Peterson currents by the PPO phases so that we can see how the PPO modulate the upward and the downward current sheets. So this top plot shows you the northern hemisphere B5 component as a function of northern PPO phase. And the bottom one shows you the meridional occurrence as a function of PPA phase. The subcurrentation currents lie on the same field lines as the PPO field line currents, superimposed on field line current sheets two and three. The PPO current systems are separated from the subcurrentation system using a sum and difference analysis. So, for example, for the northern PPO system, Summing the current profile for peak upward currents at phase 270 with the current profile for peak downward current at phase 90 should result in the northern PPO currents cancelling each other out and you are left with the PPO independent current. Because we have separated the PPO dependent currents from the PPO independent currents, you can produce fantastic movies like this, showing the northern hemisphere ionospheric meridional current plotted versus ionospheric collatitude for the independent current shown in green, the PPO, the northern PPO current shown in red and the total current shown in black. So you can very clearly see the maximum upward current at a northern phase of 90 degrees. Exactly the same for the southern hemisphere PPOs plotted versus the southern phase. Know that auroral emissions will be associated with field line currents. So here I'm showing a statistical study by Bader et al. showing the behaviour of Saturn's UV auroral emissions over the full Cassini mission. So on the left hand side, he is showing the northern aurora as a function of two cycles of northern PPA phase, plotted as a function of local time. And you can see clear auroral peaks at 90 degrees associated with the peak northward PPO upward currents into the northern hemisphere ionosphere. Similarly, on the right-hand side, Beta is plotting the southern aurora by southern PPO phase, and you can see a clear peak at 270 degrees, also associated with peak southern PPO upward currents into the southern ionosphere. Beta also reported dual modulations of the Saturnian aurora. And by this I mean you can also organise the northern aurora by the southern PPA phase, as Beta has done in this plot on the left-hand side. Get, and you find a peak in the aurora at 90 degrees north, uh, southern phase. However, this peak was not as defined as when he organised the northern aurora by the northern phase. Likewise, you can also organise a southern aurora emission by the northern PPA phase. And this fits in with the work that's been done by Tom Bradley et al. in 2017, when he sketched the overall current flow for the two PPO systems observed during the 2012 to the 2013 northern spring highly inclined orbits. The blue areas and arrows show field line currents flowing from the northern ionosphere to the south, and the red from the southern ionosphere to the north. The labelled arrows show corresponding currents in megaampere Rayleigh's, and the arid black lines show crossfield currents. And Tom Bradley demonstrated that in 2012-2013, roughly half the PPO currents closest via the opposite hemisphere, with the other half crossing, uh, closing across field lines within the magnetosphere. And that would explain why you could also organise uh, the sudden 
aurora by the northern PPA phase and the northern aurora by the to finish, I would like to talk about some recent research from the end of the Cassini mission, focusing on the 20 F-ring orbits which graced Saturn's F-ring and the 22 and a half final proximal orbits which Perijev, with Perijev inside the D-ring. I would like to talk about a fantastic study by Tom Bradley, who observed Saturn's nighttime magnetosphere during these orbits and studied, magnet studied Saturn's magnetospheric dynamic in relation to the external solar wind conditions and the internal planetary period oscillations. To understand Tom's results, we need to think about how the PPAs modulate Saturn's magnetic field and the plasma current sheet. We can think about this by summing the blue PPO perturbation fields for the northern and the southern systems with the background magnetic field shown here in black to create this perturbed magnetic field over here. So in this schematics, you can see that at the northern phase of zero and at the southern phase of 180 degrees, you have a radially extended field lines and a thinning of the current sheet. Likewise, at a northern phase of 180 degrees and at a southern phase of zero, you have a thicker current sheet. So there you can see that when the PPOs are in antiphase, you can observe maximum thickening and thinning of the current sheet. Likewise, when the PPOs are in phase, you have maximum upward and downward motion of the current sheet. And we know that when the current sheet is thin, and the equatorial field lines are radially extended, you are more likely to observe tail reconnection and magnetospheric storm-like activity. Tom studied the magnetospheric response to solar wind compression on the F-ring and the proximal orbits using a whole host of data sets, including RPWS, magnetic field, and UVs and HST observations. So here you have a quiet rev, rev 279, followed by the disturbed storm-like rev, rev 280. The data is consistent with the co-rotating interaction region hitting Saturn at the start of rev 280. You can see enhanced overall emissions in the HST dataset and also a contracted polar cap, consistent with tail reconnection and the closure of open flux. Outbound, you can also see enhanced plasma sheet ions and electrons consistent with the injection of hot plasma by tail reconnection. Tom Bradley studied the response of Saturn's magnetosphere to 20 solar wind compression events during the F-ring and proximal orbits, and he categorized these as either major compression response events or minor compression, compression response events, shown here in red and green. And he also defined quiet periods where not much was going on. the mean beat phase for the major events and the minor events. And he found that for the major events, consistent with observation of nice side reconnection signatures, these are favoured to occur when the PPOs are in antiphase. So he found that when Saturn's magnetosphere is driven by both external drivers, the solar wind, and internal drivers, the planetary period. And in this recent study, we focused on Saturn's nice side green current during the F-ring and the proximal revs. And we consider the solar wind and magnetospheric conditions as determined by Tom Bradley et al. We found that Saturn's ring current, like Saturn's magnetosphere as a whole, is driven jointly by the external solar wind and by the internal planetary period oscillations. Now, very finally, I want to talk to you about intradeering currents because in the very final 22 and a half proximal revs, Cassini crossed, crossed through the northern aurora field li line region inside the inner edge of the D-ring, which is shown here in light blue, and then outbound through the southern aurora field line current scene. The phi component on these revs, color coded by rev numbers, we observe field line currents associated with the northern field line currents here, and with the southern field line currents here, as expected. But we also observed a B5 signature 
very close to periapsis, which are served within. Okay, or the two, 2018 report, a strong field line current system located between Saturn and the inner edge of the steering, with strengths comparable to the higher latitude of all field line currents. These intradeering currents were highly variable. Karana et al. in 2018 suggested there might exist thermospheric wind-driven electric currents in the gap between Saturn and its rings. These currents will be generated when two ends of a field line are embedded in sonal fl atmospheric flows that have different wind speeds. So these are my summaries and thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Gabby. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to put them on the um, chat and I can um, unmute you or I can read them out. Um, and um, yeah. Well, oh, <clears throat> oh I, saw, I saw the one from you saying, hello, you have five minutes left, but I'm sorry, I didn't see yeah. that. <laughs> No, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll ask a question while we're waiting for other people to to come in. So do you think that I know that um, there's a campaign happening to try and look at um, Saturn when it's in the magnetotail of Jupiter? Um, mm. Do we do we know what we're expecting to see from that yet? Because I think Johnny Nichols is is one of the people involved with that. But I, I might be wrong on that. I is Johnny Nichols on the actual uh, seminar? Uh, he might be. You're I putting think... him on the spot. He's not. Yeah. No. But <laughs> he's not. No. So yeah. uh, now we all know. Yeah. That's okay. Johnny. Okay, yeah. Um, and yeah. ne next time the Leicester group are doing a crossword, please, all of you, uh, tell Johnny he should have been here. He'll really appreciate I, it. I will do. Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't. I don't really know. I know it's a very exciting uh, campaign that Johnny's involved in, and we're going to see how, for example, the aurora changes are observed. But to be quite honest, it's not something I really know about. Sorry, John. That's all right. Fair enough. And because I guess my main question would be like, what happens if you've got like a magnetic tail current sheet or something equivalent with? A planetary body with a full kind of field line current system embedded in it uh, just sounds like a kind of morass of interesting physics but um but yeah i'm i'm um my main expertise some of you may know is field line current so that's yeah kind of like, well yeah. i think i think it would be an incredibly interesting data set and i think that there's been quite a few johnny's done quite a few of model predictions i think about what they're expecting to see cool um, so we have a question from Susan McMillan, who asks um, what role the magnetic field from Ganymede uh, plays in, in this kind of thing. So like, is that something you've looked at much? And To be honest, obviously, that was one of the big discoveries of the Galileo mission. And it's not something that I looked at, but obviously that will have uh, impact on the JV magnetosphere as a whole. Uh, so I think that's probably something for further missions to, to, to study in more detail. It's not something that we, I'm looking at with the Juno data, I have to say. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, and how much longer has Juno got to send us data? Like, I don't really know when the end of it's mission. just got being extended. So we're just going into an extended mission phase, which is good because, of course, uh, at Perigeo 2, as I mentioned before, uh, the length of the orbit uh, of Juno around Jupiter was extended from something like seven days to 53 days. So we're not having done all the orbits that we wanted to do, although we're doing a lot more ex exciting science. So we've just had now, I, I think on Monday, we heard that the mission had been extended. Excellent stuff, I'm glad to hear it. It would be, um, it would be a shame if it wasn't. Um, I think um, I can't see any other questions in the chat. Um, and I notice it's, it's five past. So if people um, uh, just uh, want to head off, then more than welcome. I'm going to stay until um, people are gone, just in case anyone does have any last questions they think of. And I'm going to stop recording. So if the reason you haven't asked a question is because you were embarrassed, uh, then you can now ask and it will not be uh, kept for posterity. Um, but before I stop, uh, thank you very much again, Gabby. I think that was a great talk. And thank you, John. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for speaking with us.